Mr. Ayanal Sundaraisen, sir, Senior Advocate and President of the Madras Bar Association, to welcome the gathering and uh, introduce our speaker for today. Good morning, all. Nice to be in touch with all of you during these troubled times, at least through this uh, online session. We are grateful to our Lordship, Honorable Justice Sanjay Kishan Kaul, Judge Supreme Court of India, our former Chief Justice, for having accepted and spared time for this session on right to freedom of speech with specific interest on fake news, etc. Honorable Judge does not need any introduction. Honorable Judge was with us for quite some time and was kind to the bar and brought orderly functioning of the Madras High Court and uh, boycott free courts started after our Lordship was here. We are grateful to your Lordship for having agreed for this session and I welcome your Lordship and I thank Arvind Pandian in particular and members of the MBA Academy for having arranged for this useful session. I welcome all the persons who are waiting to listen to the Honorable Judge. Now I request the Honorable Judge to give the lecture. Thank you. Um, firstly, a very warm welcome to all my friends in Chennai. And uh, in these uh, troubled times, uh, to get an opportunity to be able to talk to you is, uh, is a great privilege itself. Um, I am normally a frequent traveler to Chennai almost every two, three months. And uh, this period has stopped my travel also, so like everybody else. So I think this is the best method of uh, uh, interaction for the time being. Um, we were discussing what, what to speak on, I thought about it. And then uh, uh, the idea of uh, the subject of freedom of speech in these times uh, appealed to me. Because the challenges I feel of these times are a little different um, uh, with respect to the topic which we are discussing as also the problem of uh, arising from the expansion of technology which has taken place. Uh, this technology has created various methods of uh, communication and spreading of information and with that has brought the problem also of uh, fake news and uh, misinformation. And in times when uh, people are not able to touch base with each other and uh, the only method of communication is through these technologies uh, this causes a far larger problem and is a greater challenge, I think, than in, even in normal times. Um, needless to say that the freedom of speech is something which our constitution makers valued greatly and uh, gave a great emphasis by including it and giving a special privilege in part three of the constitution of India. And uh, this, is, this is a valued uh, aspect of any democratic polity. Um, there are various uh, reasons why, why freedom of speech is important. And uh, if I would uh, categorize them, firstly, there would be the, the search for truth no, yes, uh, in the marketplace of idea, as Holmes and Stuart Mill would say. So uh, when you try to ferret out what is the truth, you must listen to different points of view. To listen to different points of view, you must have the right to say uh, what you want. Uh, of course, the constitution provides for a, a, a limited restriction because all freedoms come with some responsibility. Uh, then there is also an aspect of uh, self-governance. Uh, the public has to have knowledge of all the facts and circumstances before participating in the government. Unless they know what is happening, what the dispensation of power which is there uh, feels and says, as also what a different point of view may like to say, is essential for purposes of uh, creating a healthy self-governance environment. Uh, there is also an aspect of uh, self-fulfillment and autonomy, uh, which is that a, a, any human being uh, who has a mind and has the ability to think uh, should be able to exercise the capacity 
for uh, human rationality to create and express in in a symbolic system uh, central to any rationality of uh, speech and writing so a freedom of speech permits and encourages exercise of uh, these capacities in doing so it nurtures the self respect which a mature person has and gives a an avenue to uh, uh, express their point of view in a manner which is uh, not physical in character and that is how our society evolves uh, it is also important to keep in mind this is the checking value system uh, it keeps in check and uh, on abuse of power because uh, any any form of power wherever there is an absolute power there is a problem so the fact that uh, these uh, intercity checks comes helps uh, not only the persons to express their views of the governance but also of the governing to people who are governing to understand uh, what is being felt about how they they are running the systems and the emergency is a great example of it where the governance lost uh, apart from deprivation of the rights of liberty in other it deprived the government of the ability to get flow of information uh, in a right manner to gauge uh, what the people were thinking um then uh, is the issue of uh, um how you accept a tolerant society so what do you define a tolerant society to be uh, and uh, if we say that we are a tolerant society for that matter any society free speech helps to shape the intellectual character of the society uh, encouraging tolerance of uh, different ideas so in a true democracy like india you you can have people who believe uh, in a, in the right economic thinking people who believe in a centrist economic thinking the left economic thinking uh, the communists so we have shades of opinion different opinions and the choice is with the people to determine uh, uh, what system would govern them both economically and politically but the key remains the democratic quality which in turn uh, requires that uh, an exchange of ideas should take place so that the democratic quality is a meaningful a uh, system which is there um absence of um, free speech uh, also results in uh, in a conformity of character which means there is a, a lack of information so there will be lack of dissent which is available so conformity and dissent are aspects which must also emerge from uh, from this aspect of free speech and uh, uh free speech and character apart from it encourages characters traits such as inquisitiveness a distrust of authority willingness to take initiative and therefore the mind uh, of any human being which is a thinking process requires a translation of those ideas into a method of speech so that it can be conveyed the greatest importance i feel is that this obviates the need of uh, settling disputes by a physical force uh, in fact the court institutions are for that very purpose and uh, which is also in a sense an area for expression of freedom of speech uh, why do we say that the a free judiciary is important or uh, or uh, independent courts are important these institutions are important to us because only when these institutions exist are people able to express um their and settle their disputes in a proper manner this in turn uh, requires an element of free speech to be able to put forth their points of view in court and outside court and to say what is um what is their beliefs uh, and to and these beliefs can be used to persuade others it is not only a question of your belief free speech gives you the option of uh, persuading the others to your point of view so the crux of any uh, any independent democracy of a free court systems of the separation of power which exists all in turn are based on this very essential element of the freedom of speech 
Um, John Stuart Mill spoke of the need for protection from tyranny of the majority and for preventing the democratic majority from forcing their will on the minority. Milton and Brandes spoke about the need to protect dissenters. And Milton believed that citizens should hear good, bad, and thereby learn the true patience. Uh, Brennan emphasized the need to protect uh, offensive or disagreeable ideas. And uh, more recently, the Chief Justice of USA, uh, Robert, said to preserve freedom of speech, America must protect even hurtful speech on public issues to ensure that we do not stifle public debate. If I may say so, the very, very bedrock of any democratic system is this uh, freedom of speech, more than possibly any other aspect. Uh, of course, though the part three contains many freedoms and rights. Um, when you say, uh, talk about any of the freedoms, most of them, uh, the aspect of free speech in some sense, and that freedom runs through them. Um, India, um, in the present scenario, what is the challenge? This is what I, I thought would give a basis of what we say about a freedom of speech. I'm not getting into digression into issues of uh, referring to judgments, etc. Most of them are, a few listeners are legal people and that's available in the books. But the purpose was to convey my, my thoughts on this issue now. Um, let us first see a non-COVID time to a COVID time, to be able to appreciate the challenge uh, better of the current times. Um, it is a matter of concern, I feel, that uh, even uh, prior to a COVID period, we are slowly becoming, um, uh, if I may use the word, increasingly intolerant of opinions that do not match ours. And this is uh, prevalent in, in uh, all sections, unfortunately, I feel terrorizing. So, what is perceived as the middle path uh, becomes a casualty. There are uh, not always uh, blacks and whites. There are various shades of grey. There are people who may agree with part of one opinion and may agree with another part of that opinion. And uh, um, therefore, uh, as a democrat polity, how to understand and appreciate another point of view while disagreeing with it and tolerating becomes an important aspect. So, um, it, uh, you have physiologies, if I may use, that if, if particular people hold a point of view, uh, you will categorize them as a Modi Bhakt or urban Naxal or an AAP supporter. There may be different political views which may be in existence. But in this different uh, political views also, the ability to convey your idea is important. Where is that uh, in, in the last uh, uh, number of years? These tolerance levels have started going down. And I use the phrase for every section because uh, often people who are calling, calling another section intolerant become equally intolerant themselves for another point. So the shades of grey which I'm talking about suffer. And uh, you, you get into only blacks and whites. Uh, in order to protect the rights of individual, uh, to be able to freely express uh, their point of view, um, it may be most ridiculous, it may be in your perception, a vague thought or expression, but he has a right to say that. And that's what is important. It is in that context, uh, I had said in uh, Perimal Morgan case that if you do not like a book, throw it away. Because there is no compulsion to read a book. And uh, literary taste may vary. But what is right and acceptable to one may not be to the others. Yet the right to write is unhindered. Now, much before uh, saying so while upholding uh, M.F. Hussain's right to paint, which was fortunately at that time upheld by the Supreme Court, I had expressed the belief that in a real democracy, uh, the dissenter must feel at home and ought not to be nervously looking over his shoulder, fearing captivity or body harm, or economic and social sanctions for his unconventional and critical views. So there should be freedom for thought to be hit. Uh, however, 
Having said all these things, as I look at a scenario today, not long time back, I doubt whether uh, Mills or Milton or great advocates of free speech thereafter, or the makers of our Congress, uh, Constitution, um, envisage the kind of uh, disinformation, fake news, which technology has brought in, and uh, which is a part of the age of information. And the ease with which it can be spread in this new media age. I, for one, also did not, when I wrote all this, uh, think of the uh, propensity of disruption uh, which could be caused by the new age uh, media. Uh, this is so, especially in the context of that a lot of observations are made because of the traditional system of, of newspaper writings, of uh, authors writing their opinion, of uh, even uh, initially the TV channels and others, they were they evolved over a period of time. So those rights during the evolution brought their own sense of responsibilities. Editors of a newspaper were giants in their own field, and, and uh, they they had a great say, much more say than the uh, uh, than even the owners. So you had the Yirilal Jains, the Nihal Sains, the Arun Chauris, and a lot of such people who as editors ran newspapers themselves. And uh, therefore, the sense of responsibility which was prevalent in them, not only has the modern system, I would say, diluted it to some extent, because it, it starts competing with different forms. So, uh, the, the newspaper, the written material is a challenge with the the visual aspects through the TV. Uh, for now, newspapers in most parts, some of uh, more, more, large part of the country is not available or it's now being given somewhere. I, I at least don't get a newspaper, so the electronic form of newspaper is being circulated. So there seems to be in some way a competition between uh, uh, the newspapers trying to compete with the, the media as it exists. Intercede the media is trying to be uh, sometimes more virulent than the other, and they in turn are competing with the uh, aspects like Twitter, WhatsApp, Facebook, where information goes like a lightning, and without responsibility for dissemination of that information. Uh, the first question that uh, comes to my mind in this scenario would just be that. Uh, uh, can such uh, fake news and disinformation be called speech of expression as used in Article 19 1A of our Constitution? Is this also a kind of a speech or expression that makers of our Constitution were referring to? If the answer to the question is yes, then should such speech expression ought to be restricted? Um, in a recent, uh, in, in a judgment in Dennis versus United States of the early 50s, it was said that not every type of speech occupies the same position of the scale of values. There is no substantial public interest in permitting certain kind of utterances, the lewd, the obscene, the profane, the libelous, and the insulting or fighting words, those which by their very utterances inflict injury or tend to incite an immediate breach of peace. On the other hand, is the interest in free speech, the right to exert all governmental powers in aid of maintaining our institution and resisting their physical overthrow does not include intolerance of opinions and speech that cannot do harm, although opposed and perhaps alien to dominant traditional opinion. Therefore, uh, let us ask ourselves, as permitting circulation of fake news and misinformation, further any of the reasons for which freedom of speech and expression is valued. Uh, some of the factors and elements that uh, courts appear have to take into consideration while deciding whether a restriction of speech is reasonable or not are, uh, firstly, the intention uh, with which the speech and expression is made, the effect or consequence or even the probable consequence 
of that speech. Uh, sometimes courts are even influenced by the general prevailing circumstances and political conditions. And in these parameters, let us now see how fake news and information in the age of COVID becomes a greater problem. And we come to the COVID period from the pre-COVID period. Uh, if I may identify, there are three main uh, actors in this. Uh, there are people who are who's holding position of power and uh, influence. They may be journalists, they may be politicians, they may be celebrities. The second is the anonymous authors of WhatsApp forwards, memes and other fake news and misinformation being shared on social media. And the third is those who forward the misinformation and fake news generated by me. This is so that, and especially in these days when other methods of people being occupied are less, the time spent on, on these is much more than even the normal activity is on. And we have seen how uh, information often, say in WhatsApp, where a lot of folks, most of you are there, would be forwarded uh, from one to the other, even uh, without any thought process. Something comes and you forward it, and from there it goes to the next one. But this is more apparent from the fact that at times you'll see in the same WhatsApp group, people not even reading what is being posted but forwarding. So the same WhatsApp would be forwarded two, three times within a span of a short period of time. Uh, it itself being circulated uh, just prior to that time. The object of the last one, when it is forwarded, is of course to help the others and uh, would normally have acted bona fide in the belief that the information is proven correct. Though I would say that it is also being forwarded in a sense mindlessly because uh, uh, you are not even seeing whether that information has already been forwarded and you not care to wait and see or verify whether that uh, information is, is correct or not. It is left for the uh, person receiving the information to judge. And that person in turn will further forward information uh, without leaving it to the third person to judge. And in a short span of time, there is a complete uh, a widespread information, whether even if it is incorrect and false. Um, then uh, we have a uh, uh, question that uh, should there be a burden on such a person to verify the accuracy of the uh, information being shared by him? Um, C is slightly different, the last part I said, but so far as the first two are concerned, the intents may vary, but uh, it would be difficult to appropriately generalize them. Now, in this period of time in COVID, there is a lot of information and news available on the internet, on social media, concerning, for example, the alleged remedies, cures in even preventive measures, um, the origin of the virus, how did it originate, uh, allegations about people who are helping to spread the virus, including by not following lockdown measures by the government. And uh, some of these news then take uh, racial and uh, religious colors. Uh, issues whether China has spread the virus deliberately or not. Uh, is it to cause economic damage? Particular communities, whether they believe that this uh, problem will be solved of its own um, or whether they have uh, created the problem. So, this kind of misinformation in the time period and as it is, people are more secluded in their environments. Creates a, a great uh, problem in the minds of the people, which will have a reflection not only in the current times, but I believe can have a reflection in a longer time frame. To get out of uh, that, that mental process, even when slowly things start opening as are expected to um, some, some, if not all, of this information is really misinformation, and I would say fake news. Now, uh, some may be arising from beliefs, for example, the, the remedies, uh, even to the extent that uh, we, we had uh, petitions under Article 32 being filed that 
uh, issue amendments that a particular remedy must be enforced, medical remedy or another remedy must be enforced. <coughs> Naturally, the, the courts did not intervene because this is not their job. Uh, but uh, the question is, if there is such misinformation and fake news, um, how will, who will determine whether this should be disseminated or not? Um, government may have more pressing concerns at the moment. And giving powers to the government carries its own uh, challenges because the, the possibility of it being uh, uh, misused always remains. The uh, spread of some of the misinformation and fake news may be harmless. Uh, for example, if somebody says, oh, this kind of uh, simple medication is helpful or this kind of food may or may not be helpful. But uh, any threat to public health, safety and public order uh, may incite people to an offence that the, there may be possibility of committing offences even when things open up. Uh, forget even in the current environment. Uh, we have had past examples of this misinformation even in normal times causing grave, grave problem. Uh, in 2017, a rumor of a band of child kidnappers made the rounds of WhatsApp, uh, creating an angry mob that ultimately killed four innocent men, according to the New York Times. Later, three more men were killed by another mob. There was no evidence of any men were actual kidnappers. So how will this be determined? We had example in Delhi, I remember many years back when uh, uh, it was alleged that a particular uh, headmistress of a school was uh, taking the girls towards the wayward ways. And the, the parents almost lynched the person. Uh, the police saved the person, the lady from being lynched, and ultimately it found that it was really a completely fake news made for publicity sake. So, if these can be in the aggravating position in normal circumstances, uh, the spread of fake news during this time period, if that is assimilated in the mind, then the possibility of it exploding when things start opening poses a great danger to my mind. Um, issue is, as I said before, uh, should steps be taken to prevent publication of such misinformation and fake news? And to the extent to which uh, this should be curtailed and how? Can it be left to the government, which is, which is also a problematic idea? In the uh, ideal world, uh, speech can rebut speech. And so such fake news as information can be uh, rebutted by the truth. Um, but uh, despite the fact that a, a large number of scientists have uh, have been working on the, trying to find a solution. Uh, the response to COVID-19, the false information is itself, to my mind, uh, 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 a virus. Uh, in fact, uh, it is, uh, it has the propensity of, of uh, affecting people in the longer run even more than the virus for which some solution may be found. Uh, turning to the challenges now being posed by the social media, uh, what is the difficulty in, in, in uh, controlling them? The United Nations Human Rights Council passed a non-binding resolution in 2016, recognizing internet as a basic human right. Um, 2015, far back, there were 3.5 billion people in the world who accessed internet. On Facebook, there were 3 million photographers updating, updated per day. In uh, every minute, it, is said, it was said that 510 comments and about 3 lakh um, uh, uh, you know, statuses are posted. Uh, in um, or more than five years back, there were 200 billion Twitter tweets on Twitter. These are figures to show how immense is the, the ability to uh, disseminate such information which may be false. Now, therefore, there is a distinction between publication on the internet and publication in the print media. 
and the challenges by these forms of dissemination of information is far greater um the high speed the high volumes of this dissemination renders a pre censorship highly difficult so the important difference is that uh, what can be done is only to remove what is the disinformation or misinformation which is prevalent and uh, how to make people understand that automatic uploading without application of mind on the part of these platforms would create a problem um there are uh, aggregators or facilitators often referred to as intermediaries which is recognized by this court uh social media platforms do have their codes and guides for prohibiting for instance hate speech but uh this issue is even more be debated now in view of uh, certain developments in the us and i i saw some aspects being debated uh, in the in the visual media also on this aspect arising there from um it is say uh, what extent is the liability of google is an issue which uh, reached the highest court on several occasions this is pre and post amendments to section 79 of the it act but as things stand today a post amending and reading down the section 79 in pursuance to the shia single case the liability of an intermediary uh, is limited effectively only arises when the intermediary fails to remove or take down information in violation of a take down order uh, the debate i saw the other day was on the basis that suppose Uh, the platform itself becomes an instrument of uh, propagating a particular viewpoint and would remove only an opposite viewpoint then uh, um, that platform has the event capacity to influence uh, people over a period of time and create also unrest if unnecessary so that debate was uh, how to deal with the situation whether a government uh, action is necessary but i i keep repeating that uh, government controls have always their own problem uh in the whether a law will come or not this is already in debate in the in 2018 this debate started in the monsoon session of parliament on issues of social media platform that spreading of fake news motion was admitted and the detailed statement was made on behalf of the government as uh, a draft information rules were prepared uh and the draft information technology intermediary guidelines amendment rules proposed to increase the burden to regulate the intermediaries and also give government greater and easier access to data exchanged through these intermediaries uh those draft rules are in different stages of scrutiny uh, and that uh, issue will be when the parliament now debates in the post covid time Uh, how will it go um see it has always been said earlier that the pen is mightier than the sword but today the pen has been replaced by the keyboard uh, access to which is today in hands of everybody so to specialize knowledge to express your point of view or your opinion as authors writers journalists is uh, is not a confined space so anybody or everybody who knows anything about it or doesn't know anything about it on um, on these platforms come and uh, if one may say if the language becomes more and more abusive and oppressive and uh, the the decorum and decency are lost at times because there are such strong views that the, there is an intolerance to the other view itself um there is no writing in that sense as earlier was with some knowledge and sense of responsibility and uh, this has of course been a casualty in the present age of social media uh, let us look at even aspects of trolling so if that particular view point is not right a different view point may troll it so i i came across uh, 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 a uh, lady who had been educated in harvard talking that uh, she had a particular view point which may not be in conformity with 
um, some of the alumni from that university and almost a threat was held out that she should be taken off from the alumni because that was not the predominant point of view of uh, the alumni. These are all examples I am giving how intolerance in every, in, in every sphere is causing a problem in aggravating situation. Um, we also have a problem because, see, if, if the press is writing, the press are given badges. Uh, the editors, publishers are uh, responsible for the content of publication under the Press and Registration Act. Um, every person can't get work published. Um, writing is the bread and butter of the journalists and writers, and hence uh, these people uh, certainly act with more sense of responsibility. While uh, there may be other people who may be doing different jobs, but utilize their free time for maybe for uh, uh, not propagating the point of view, but abusing another point of view. That makes the difficulty. And in that process, even creating news, which is not the truth or is fit. So the checks and balances, um, which are prevalent in, in uh, regulated professions, are not available on such platforms. Internet is a free platform. You can publish anything. Um, and the writers have uh, nothing at stake. So the, the shares uh, of the writing have even, even less at stake. You will just be transmitting it. Um, which is a complete absence of checks and balances and no accountability for what is published on these forums. Yet the reach of these social medias is so immense and widespread uh, as compared to the traditional forms of publishing that those forms of publishing are seeking a, uh, feeling a challenge. Now, we are seeking a data boom absolutely. And uh, people who don't have access to newspaper and books have access to uh, phones and WhatsApp and Facebook. Now everything is at the, at, even at the phone level. So, and phones is something which, which uh, uh, with, with the current technology is available to most people, even uh, segments of society which may not be economically that well off. Uh, it is almost a necessity a mobile phone which is being used. So, uh, uh, in a traditional television program, films, newspaper, there is uh, a viewership of the reader. The choice of the reader or viewer is limited to viewing that content or reading the same. Internet works on a a different uh, principle and uh, the viewer has complete control and he exercises his choice as to what content he would wish to read and view. But uh, the point is that when, when uh, especially in these present times, when we keep saying that uh, I've been saying what, don't read what you don't like, don't see what you don't like, uh, the confinement in the areas of space uh, the curtailment of any work, uh, the lack of employability, the lack of engagement of mind. Uh, this has become a major source of uh, information, entertainment, occupation of time, whatever way we may call it. So the times which people are sending on watching a mobile phone and a WhatsApp is much greater. So in that sense, it pays, you know, poses the greatest challenge as uh, Say for Facebook, they said there are more than 200 million users in India. Maximum information is possibly spread through WhatsApp. Uh, the IT Act, uh, Section 69A, the government has the power to issue blocking orders. But uh, uh, that has its own limitations because of, of the area uh, in which they can intervene, and rightly so, because no unrestricted right for containment was to be given. Um, Twitter or Instagram uh, or no posting on WhatsApp as such, uh, which can be taken down or blocked, are aspects um, which are challenged, especially say WhatsApp is protected and, and, uh, and encrypted. Now that protects privacy, which is another aspect of the right. But in the bargain, anything and everything can be disseminated without uh, checking up. Um, to my mind, one of the most important things is it's a long term measure, but uh, there has to be a greater uh, awareness um, 
not to share information without verification. I know it is easier said than done. But this is what I began by saying that mindlessly sharing information without verification is a large part of the problem. Because if one or two people give this misinformation and others don't spread it, then uh, the problem can be, uh, if not obliterated, at least curtailed. But if everybody starts mindlessly advancing that, uh, then uh, the problem increases. Um, the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology had issued an advisory on 20th March that all social media platforms to curb fake news and misinformation of coronavirus. Um, it was sent after noticing what will happen. This is one example of how from the beginning of the problem, misinformation about this very subject in this uh, environment, even by the government was uh, perceived to be a great challenge. There are concerns as I mentioned of trolling on social media. There are concerns of uh, obscenity. Now, you had the example of a voice locker group on Instagram. There is still a debate what happened. And as it unfolded, many ramifications came out. Some boy has taken his life, unfortunately. Uh, somebody was trying to test, as they say, a friend of his. But look at the ramifications that went on. So, and there is in public an outcry when these things occur. And there is a the demand for uh, uh, instant uh, justice. That is another aspect of the problem. See this, uh, I'm not defending that the courts take system is taking too much of time. I fully believe that in this day of this technology, therefore, an earlier dispensation of justice system is very important. But uh, instant justice can also do great injustice because it, it's uh, just a hard mentality which takes over. And you feel uh, on the basis of some information, somebody has done wrong without any verification. Still, you are at the receiving end of it. That's why I keep saying that when you endeavor to do street justice, Please remember, you can be at the end of that someday, depending on how the situation develops. Um, hate speech is another aspect uh, which is creating a problem in many ways during this period of time. Um, speech may be attacking the governor, government for every measure taken to handle the current situation, and then corresponding actions being taken. So. What is happening is, it's part of a overall intolerance of the different viewpoints, which is, to my mind, causing this problem. Uh, the instruments uh, to propagate a view have uh, exceeded the limits, I feel, at times. And uh, what has to be taken is a step back to not only verify information in these times, but count 10 times before you, you respond to something. Uh, that could help in trying to gather a middle path, which is necessary. Um, my concern, as I said, is also that um, this rise in uh, hate speech, uh, by, uh, or seditious speech, or any of these aspects, uh, are we taking uh, offense too easily? Have we lost uh, every sense of humor also? Something I always think, the only thing from the British we needed to inherit and we haven't. The good sense of humor and, and a society discipline. So, have we become so intolerant uh, and uh, are provoked so easily? And uh, this is apparent from, uh, look at how on, on uh, aspects of religion, on uh, different aspects of social thinking, People just rush to court, how on films being shown, on films being shown, there appears to be intolerance to even the slight concept of there being something which is different from what you believe in. Um, any regulation of social media, the problem is there is some impingement of free speech and the uh, right to privacy. Given the structure of the social media implementing the existing law, um, it becomes very close to impossible to control it. Uh, the struggle, therefore, is the view to regulate social media 
without uh, regulation of the free speech. Um, this uh, method of uh, um, disinformation during this time, uh, examples have uh, come from different countries also. So, for example, in, uh, in Austria, uh, the um, region of Style area, the anti-discrimination office reported on state-sponsored app ban hate developed for tracking online hate speeches and the content blame, blaming refugees for, say, COVID-19. Similarly, in Italy, uh, the wave of uh, xenophobia and hate speeches against a particular community uh, from the country where this problem arose has been an issue. Um, and uh, therefore, uh, reports of this nature, there is a, a misinformation uh, and fake news, uh, propaganda propensity, which has got more aggravated uh, during this period of time. And uh, creating uh, hostility against uh, identifiable groups. Uh, and uh, I think it's a challenge for all, all of us. Uh, how can we be more responsible? How do we disseminate uh, what is accurate, what is not accurate? And uh, what can be the methodology of, of uh, uh, controlling this? Um, there is a marketplace of ideas which has to, which is there. The idea is to also make everybody think, <coughs> think what is the possibilities which can happen and find out solutions because a large part of this audience is people from the legal fraternity and uh, and uh, they are, I think, the best suited to determine how the balancing should take place. Uh, I would uh, also say this, that uh, this kind of uh, intolerance uh, is also reflected at times in both uh, the, the against the institution, including the judiciary at times. I say with some hesitation and trepidation, but the judiciary performs a particular role. Uh, it doesn't have an opportunity to respond. Uh, criticism of uh, a viewpoint, a judgment, there is no problem. Because I always believe the judgment is an opinion. It's an opinion, it may hold tomorrow, it may not hold tomorrow courts review their own opinions. So, uh, you may also sometimes criticize if you think a particular philosophy is uh, taking root. But when imputation and grading starts being made, I think we damage the very institutions. The unfortunate part is uh, some of us who have been part of this institution itself, whether from this side of the bench and the bar, because most of us have been members of the bar and uh, even people who have joined the bench, or people who have joined the bench. Uh, there is a problem that of after me the deluge, which is that uh, since we are gone, uh, everything is going wrong. I would say that itself is a danger. Uh, we are an evolving society, things will evolve. Things have evolved over a period of time. People in the past who speak about it also committed many mistakes and blunders. But uh, to remain in, in, uh, in, the, in news has also become a problem. Therefore, the tendency to be more uh, <coughs> critical and critical in a manner which I would say crosses certain lines is a problem. This is also to some extent of the pandemic or, or the information pandemic also which is taking place, the misinformation pandemic. I hope that there is a rethink on this process and uh, members of the bar, of the public of, and of part of the judiciary who have been here must appreciate the challenges of any time and challenges of a system. And uh, while criticism is always information, 
that must come to us. I think some boundaries need to be maintained because otherwise it becomes a part of a disinformation which causes doubts on institutions. And I don't think that's good for uh, any system because if you mistrust everybody, mistrust every system, and we have no system, then you have an anarchy. If you have to prevent an anarchy, faith in institutions is important. Those institutions also owe an obligation to stand by certain norms, but people who have been part of the institutions also owe to the institutions to see that it is not uh, unnecessarily vilified and not vilified in a manner which causes damage to the institution itself. Um, I hope we have better times to come by. Uh, I am hopeful that uh, the Almighty who from where this thing has occurred, there will be some way to take this away. Uh, we will see better economic times. We will see more uh, functional courts the normal way. Not only the virtual courts, which is the need of the day, but as is our challenge is. And I'm confident all of us will emerge stronger, um, both as a country and as the world, and realize uh, how uh, the problems can be common. Uh, we have been talking in terms of uh, that uh, the nationalism is more out of the day of the day, and that the world becoming uh, uh, one place has suffered uh, damage. But I feel uh, while people may be protecting their smaller turfs, uh, the realization that there can be a pandemic of this magnitude, which affects the world at large, irrespective of the of the power of that country, and that uh, any amount of uh, science and technology and uh, warfare could not prevent it, is an example how the human race must learn to uh, live with itself, live with the other beings, and live with the earth, because this present process is in some way a protest by nature against the human race, putting the human race into their uh, rooms and houses, so that uh, other methods of life and the nature revitalizes itself. That, I think, should be a learning experience for the human race. That we have to change, we have to mend ourselves, because this world, uh, the earth, is meant for not only the human race, but meant for many other living forms and the nature. And destruction of nature and other forms of living affects the balance which produces such results. Um, this is a little off from the topic, but I think uh, unless the human race uh, learns from this experience, uh, we will face a greater problem. And if we emerge stronger, I'm sure we'll see a better world. Thank you very much for the patience and time. Thank you very much, uh, Lord Shiv, for uh, giving us uh, such a wonderful insight, very open and frank uh, account of, of the topic. I now call upon uh, a good friend of mine, Arvind Srivatsa, to post you his first question. Arvind? Thank you, my lord. Is my, is my lord able to hear me? Yes, I'm able to hear you. Yes, thank you. My lord, thank you for the wonderful lecture. My lord, just were pleased to refer to the provisions of the Disaster Management Act. Yes. My lord, with reference to misinformation vis-a-vis -vis COVID, Section 54 of the Act talks about false warnings. And also, my lord, Section 5051B of the IPC talks about spreading of information with intent to cause uh, any obstruction with peace and tranquility in the country. Yes. My Lord, please to candidly capture the test wherein the state or uh, state can regulate whether such information is misinformation or correct. Well, so my question to your Lordship is: there seems to be a conflict between right to information, that is, right not to be misinformed to the larger public versus the right to freedom of speech and expression as a citizen in the country. How, therefore, in my Lordship's view, will we resolve that conflict? See, uh, I mean, the, what has to be seen is, uh, these are challenging times, there are different times. What 
parameters will apply in normal times uh, cannot apply here. For example, if you have a war, a physical war with another country, yeah. some different parameters take over for that period of time. And there are curtailments of certain rights which are experienced. So, when such a disaster strikes, there is bound to be some curtailment of certain rights which will happen. We are also faced with uh, another problem here that uh, nobody knows any better how, how this problem is arisen, when this problem will go, how will it pan out. So it's even different from a war. It's an it's, uh, undisclosed enemy. So uh, I think all over the world, countries are experimenting in mind privacy. And therefore, uh, till we find a solution, until this uh, act is enforced, there is bound to be some curtailment of rights and a trusted institutional establishment has to take subject to their accountability. Yes, I am not saying they are not accountable. And I would say there is a greater responsibility on, uh, on the governments of the day to give the correct distribution to people uh, so that the level of this disinformation is also reduced. Thank you, Milan. Uh, Barani Dharan has a question. Barani, please go ahead. My Lord, thank you for the very valuable and informative session. Uh, my Lord, what is your valuable opinion and suggestion to strike a balance between the freedom of speech on one hand and at the same time to prevent the dissemination of misinformation, during, especially during this ongoing crisis? Uh, the problem is that uh, any democracy goes on the basis of responsible citizenry. Uh, of course, there will be deviant people, but a large part of the citizenry should be responsible. What happens in these times of COVID is that there is a disturbed frame of mind in most of the people. You are suddenly locked up, your work is stopped, people are uh, scared of losing their jobs, have lost jobs. Um, uh, people are worried how will be the tomorrow. Um, lawyers may be aware when the courts will uh, function. Students are worried that how will the education uh, start from primary level to the highest level. And these are the, one of the biggest challenges I feel are uh, the education institutes, the courts, apart from the hospitality and travel industry, and all other things. So uh, when you are confronted with this, your mind is most susceptible to accepting uh, uh, misinformation as information. Therefore, uh, I think some greater regulation becomes necessary from the point of view of curtailment of this by even the platforms. And secondly, uh, more thinking and responsible citizens should help in this process by uh, giving the, the, the true views and yet not taking extreme postures. Uh, when, when the thinking people start taking uh, talking in a uh, in a uncontrolled manner, I think uh, we have a problem at hand, and uh, this is happening to my mind. Where educated people are also going uh, in extreme directions, and uh, and uh, this, in fact, in turn, uh, is not going to improve the situation but cause damage to institutions. Uh, these are times when it is a challenging time for everybody, uh, including uh, all institutions, governments, sports, capital kind of people. Uh, you can't uh, grade the institutions and people to live with. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have Ashwin Prem Sundar who has a question. Ashwin, please go. My lord, are you able to, am I audible, my lord? Yes, very much, very much. Uh, Manoj, you had uh, spoken about uh, a certain topic on uh, fake news creators, which are uh, basically categorized into three influencers, creators, and forwarders. Yes. Uh, my question is more uh, relevant to the creators. Now, uh, reasonable restrictions under Article 19.2 uh, and more specifically towards public order in this COVID times. Uh, 
there is a thin line that separates mere criticism of government which is uh, predominantly done by the creators of fake news and things and uh, certain aspects of sedition which incites disaffection towards the government now what would be your lordship's take on uh, on the entire aspect and uh, what is the judicial test that would come in to segregate these two lines uh, so that uh, you know we are very clear that uh, mere criticism even during uh, covid times is not considered as an uh, offence under section 124a of ipc and uh, you know or it is a clear cut indication that this is sedition i mean this is something which is not required at this particular point in time your response let, let me first begin with when uh, in these times i would say there is a greater responsibility with the government and there has to be a greater faith and trust with the government because people may not know better um, and that's true of all institutions people may not know better and the information flow is with the government but that in turn brings a lot of greater responsibility on them uh, to manage the situation to the best possible uh, i i don't think criticism of a policy this is a how things have to be handled how things are being handled or will be handled is sedition by any such way a sedition is something different but um, when you say thin line the thin line starts we are supposed there is a concerted group which gets into a campaign for uh, uh, what i may call the info damage information problem and the objective is to create disinformation uh, to create uh, uncertainty in the society then it becomes a thin line even then i would say it's a thin line i i would still say that one, one would be in favor of uh, uh, giving them the benefit of doubt of a thought process or their beliefs and it has to be something very serious to be able to put it in the other way even in this time i i think only the line is slightly drawn the back that's all it's not that the the, the line is only that your lordship's views are very liberal views so to that extent that okay. you know that uh, i feel in any democratic quality that is there but i i think we are facing uh, very difficult challenges therefore i'm saying we need to think difficult challenges is that part of a a, a thought or a philosophy which has always been open to that be but uh, the um, the non tolerance of the other thought and philosophy if i may say so always you a calls b is intolerant the point is b is also uh, the other one is also equally intolerant of the other point the, the concept of coexistence of view points is getting lost in this picture and it is coming back to what in the in hindi is called to my way which is you know you get into a, a petty and abusive petty fight, fight. fight. and it is abusive in character you see the language i mean i i have seen the most horrendous language even by liberal standards uh, you don't go around abusing everybody but that's what it is slowly that is becoming the expression that's the identity a good a criticism or a humor and a, a, a humorous criticism is giving way to a language which is uh, carping and uh, uh, i i think all of you see in the uh, Visual media also uh, one competes against the other to take the benchmark higher. <laughs> yes, your lordship. Thank you, your lordship. Thank you, lordship. And we have Naveen with a question, lordship. Naveen, uh, please post it. Uh, uh, thank you, your lordship, for the valuable session. Uh, lordship, my question is that is Article Nineteen being a blockade and restraint on the government to, enf to effectively enforce preventing fake news and uh, misinformation because when right to ex freedom of expression is a fundamental right right a uh, freedom of expression made with a malefied intent to cause misinformation and fake news does it or say uh, go against the policy of uh, the fundamental right so is the government being yes uh, please continue is is a government being restrained and uh, if it, uh, a blockade is being made on the government to give, uh, make it a better regulations to prevent these fake news and uh, misinformation your views are not no i i i think article 19 is it is too important to uh, to give way to any other thought process despite these challenges and i don't think anything is a restriction the only thing is when when these laws were drawn when uh, 
uh, the constitutions were drawn, this kind of technological challenges are not there. But every document is uh, is progressive and uh, nothing is constant. The only thing uh, which is uh, constant is change. So changes have to occur. I am sure uh, uh, the government is not without remedy, with relevant thought process to see how these platforms can bring in a self-regulation. I would any day prefer a self-regulation mechanism than to a government regulation mechanism. And I think the importance of the government is to press for these platforms and methods to meet regulation processes, which must be meant independently uh, to curtail this kind of uh, disinformation, misinformation. Uh, I would still be very hesitant to give some kind of a absolute power to the government to this. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lordship. I think that brings uh, an end to the questions also that we have. Uh, can we call uh, Senior Counsel Ms. Uh, S. Arthasarathy, our Chairman for the FBI Academy, to say his closing remarks uh, and uh, thank you. It was such a wonderful lecture, my Lord, and uh, we, are also, uh, we are also happy that you could take, take, uh, take some time out to be with us and uh, we wish that uh, we come out of this situation early and so that we have normal uh, court working. Thank you, my Lord, once again for taking out your lordship's precious time in the morning on a Sunday. We have disturbed you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk to all of you and giving me an opportunity to say something from my heart on very, many issues which may have troubled you. <laughs> much obliged. Thank you, my Lord. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, Lord. Thank you. Thank you.